Canada Day Community Drive-In Worship Service 10 a.m. July the 1st, Harrow Soccer Complex Parking Lot The churches and pastors of Harrow Ministerial Association invite you to join them at the Harrow Soccer Complex Parking Lot 2225 Roseboro Road in Harrow. We thought with all the challenges and difficulties people are facing at this time, it would be good for the community to come together. The service will be brief and simple with the aim of giving thanks to God for Canada, to pray for God's blessing and for the strength and wisdom to create a better future. We will collect donations of food and cleaning supplies for the Herald Food Bank. We wish to thank Town Councillor Sherry Bondi, the Director of and staff of the Community Services Department of the Town of Essex and the Harrow OPP for their support, advice and encouragement. We will follow these simple rules to protect everyone. You have to stay in your vehicle. The people in your vehicle need to be from your family or social bubble. Vehicles will park in every second parking spot to allow the need for safe distancing. If you have to go, you have to go home. The washrooms won't be open. June the 27th miracle, the work is not over. Can you help with the sorting and repacking of groceries at the Harrow Arena? Pastor Karen from Harrow Mennonite Church is one of the local organizers. Email her at office at harrowmennonite.on.ca if you could help on Monday or Tuesday this week. And those are the announcements for June the 28th. My 86 year old father is going to join me to sing this morning. Do we have, did we have music for the uh, lyrics or no? No? Uh oh. <laughs> we're on our own. <laughs> we were hoping that we were going to have a sing along. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest. And the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Going forth with weeping, sowing for the Master, Though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. 
When our wedding's over, He will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Hello everyone and welcome to our worship video for June 28th. This has turned out to be a very busy week. There have been a number of losses in our community and it's been my privilege to spend time with several families as they began to say their goodbyes and then got ready for funerals for loved ones. I ask you to remember in your prayers the families of Lucille Craig, Nelda Vollens, and Bill Gorick. I'm very happy to I have another interview to share with you this week. It's a great conversation I had with a spirited person of faith. Uh, my friend Jennifer Potter, the Reverend Jennifer Potter, is a minister with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. She and her husband Shannon are on staff at the Evangel Pentecostal Church in Oakville. Evangel is a wonderful congregation with vital ministries that make a big difference in people's lives. As you listen to the interview, you'll hear Jennifer share from her own life and also about a ministry she's founded that works to help people who unfortunately get caught up in human trafficking. Some of what she has to say may be hard to hear, but the passion and drive she brings to her work is truly inspiring. To go with this interview, this conversation I had with Jennifer, I chose a reading from Romans in the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 28. I'm reading from a paraphrase called The Message. I've made some small editorial changes in the text. From Romans. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what God is doing. And God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of God. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome God's presence, in whom God dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, God will do the same thing in you that God did in Jesus, bringing you alive. When God lives and breathes in you, and God does as surely as in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With God's Spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us. Nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's Spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, What's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who God is, and we know who we are, loving parent and children, and we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. 
God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. All around us we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That's why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what's enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. The Spirit does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. The Spirit knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. And may God bless those words and help us. Amen. Jennifer, welcome to Harrow. Thank you. Um, I wish I was a different person. <laughs> oh, well, we, you know, we would really like that too. Um, Lexi and I have wanted for, for a while for you, you and Shannon to see the house and spend some time here. Um, maybe when this is all different or normal again. So um, this is my friend Jennifer Potter. Jennifer and her husband Shannon are pastors at a Pentecostal church in Oakville. And uh, Lexi and, and I and Jennifer and Shannon have been friends for, for a while. One of the, my favorite memories is that um, Jennifer and Shannon took Lexi and I on a, on a whale watching cruise in Newfoundland and I got screeched in. Um, we didn't see any whales. We saw lots of puffins, and I and I got I got uh, I got screeched in. But that's that's kind of a fun memory. Um, Jennifer grew up in the United Church, um, and then I guess saw the light, and, and uh, um, has had has had a, had a wonderful ministry in, in the Pentecostal Church for 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 a long time. Uh, but I shouldn't tell her story, Jennifer. I should let you talk about yourself and and uh, who you are and those things in ministry that you're most passionate about. Sure. You just want me to jump right in, do you? Absolutely. <laughs> well, what do you want me to tell you first? That's a whole lot. Well, talk about you and, and, and maybe how you, and maybe a sense of your call to ministry. Oh, okay. Well, me, um, if I was to describe myself right now, I would say that I'm, um, um, a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats. I'm a daughter. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a pastor. Um, and we'll talk probably more about it later, but I, um, the, I'm the founder of an anti-human trafficking organization. Um, I'm living with cancer. And um, yeah, I have, a, I, I have a lot of different aspects to my life. Um, I did grow up in the United Church and uh, went with my parents. Um, some of you may know Collier Street United Church in Barrie. That was my church. That's the church that I got married in, actually. Um, but uh, definitely um, became a Christian at the age of 18 um, through the lovely youth group that was there and the, the youth pastor and his his love for Jesus and how he just made it so real and so personal was just drawn to God through him and um, and then shortly after that just really felt the call to full-time ministry felt that I needed to train for a life of leading other people into the same experience that I had had and um, ended up going to Eastern Pentecostal Bible College in Peterborough at the time it's now called Master's College and Seminary but trained there and met my husband, that who's from Newfoundland. That's why we were with um, Lexi and Daryl in Newfoundland. We met there, and um, we've been pastoring um, since 1988 together in various Pentecostal churches. But I must say, um, I feel 
I feel like I'm a united girl at heart. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Do, do, do you want to choose, do you want to say now a little bit more about the, your, your, your own ministry, One for All? Oh, the 4-1. Um, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, in 2012, going into 2013, I had started to hear a lot about human trafficking. I attended some conferences where there were people speaking about it. I hadn't known very much about it until then. I feel like a lot of my life I've had my head in the sand about a lot of issues <laughs> that I'm just beginning to become much more aware of in the last few years. But that one in particular just gripped my soul and it just wouldn't let up. And I began learning and reading and watching movies and talking to people and getting all the information that I could um, absorb. It was very difficult. It's a very, it's a very hard issue to delve into. Um, it's very dark, but um, it just wouldn't let up. And in 2014, through a series of circumstances, a group of us founded what is called Four One Oakville. And um, basically, we wanted to be the people, like we wanted to be someone that did something about the issue instead of just hearing about it and feeling bad about it, feeling the typical, you know, somebody should do something about that. We wanted to be the people that did something about it. And so we started by bringing awareness to the issue, particularly here in Ontario, because it's so prevalent here. And so that began um, a whole new chapter of my life. I've met all kinds of wonderful people through doing that. Um, really, that's how I met Lexi and Daryl, through bringing awareness in this area. And um, it's been challenging, it's been fascinating, it's heartbreaking, um, but I've been thrilled to do it and um, yeah I just um, been very um, influenced by different people in my life or people that I read and people that I met um, to just keep on pressing forward even when it felt like such a huge issue that you know what could little old I do uh, about something so big and so dark but um, there's been lots of encouragers. Jennifer excuse me um I know what you mean by human trafficking, uh, and, and I, I absolutely think it's the, it's the right label for what you for what you've engaged in. Um, but but can you say more about what what that means for the victims of human trafficking? What's oh yeah, on? yeah, of course. Now there's many different types of human trafficking: labor trafficking, and forced you know different forced labors. There's um, organ trafficking, and there's sexual exploitation, and that's the one that for one deals with um that's when somebody is exploited um by another um for the purpose of of profit through um you know through the sexual exploitation and so this is not um somebody you know for lack of better word choosing to do this on their own this is when somebody is um manipulated them in some way um and i do say the word choice very um with tongue in cheek because i don't really believe that anybody would choose a life like this if there were viable alternatives. I think that a lot of people in this world are vulnerable and are facing food and housing insecurity and turn to something that they feel they can do to provide for themselves. I don't necessarily call that cho a choice, um, but there. But in terms of trafficking, um, we're looking at somebody else profiting from the exploitation of another. So in Ontario, you see a lot of particularly young women who are what we call groomed by a boy, boyfriend, someone who appears to be a boyfriend. Um, and, and through the romance, through providing everything that the young woman needs or wants in her life, draws them into a life where they, and eventually they, um, ask them to participate in in um in sexual activities for their profit and that's how trafficking is commonly um started in ontario that's the most common way 
I have uh, the folks from Harrow last weekend watched an interview I did with with another friend, another colleague in ministry who um, she experienced her call to ministry while she was wor working with the AIDS Committee of Windsor, mm -hmm. and she she said it very clearly that, that she doesn't believe that anybody grows up with a dream of being a sex trade worker um, or of being a, a, an IV drug user that um, they grow up as little boys, little girls with, with um, you know, hopes and dreams and they want to be loved and want to be cared for and want to have, have a good life. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the, the notion that someone grows up and that's, that's going to be their choice that, 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 I'm with you. That's really that's really hard to um, get my heart or my mind around. Yeah, absolutely. When the word choice implies that there's alternatives, and if you know, for so many people, there aren't any alternatives or ones that they can see. Unfortunately, so yeah, yeah. Okay. I can remember uh, getting getting to know you and learning about the work you were doing, and. Um, Packing up a, a couple of the parcels that that, that uh, you, you and your your coworkers have made available to people, I, I'd love you to say something about that. Um. Oh, absolutely. Um, in obviously, I've done a lot of work in the area of bringing awareness to human trafficking. But the other end, bookend of what Four One does is um, we want to bring survivors support. So we put a lot of effort into helping to bring awareness to the need for supportive housing. But also we partnered with Defend Dignity in providing what we call first response bags. And these things, these bags are really great. And that's what Daryl's speaking of there. They're a bag full of um, emergency toiletry items, pajamas, a blanket, a journal, chocolate, things that a young woman would need. Um, when she has um, escaped a trafficker, just come out from under that, is perhaps um, staying at a shelter or a, in most cases in a hotel room and doesn't have anything of her own. And so these bags are meant to help fulfill some of that need and also show them how much they're loved and cared about um, from the community. And so these bags cost about $250 each to fill. But I found specifically the church community has been really great in donating money, donating supplies, individuals wanting to fill these bags. And then they are taken by various agencies in Halton, by the Halton Victim Services, by the police, and given to these young women. So it's been, it's been very great. And um, we've had some great feedback on how much they have meant. It's meant so much to receive this very tangible and practical um, gift of love. I remember how, how, how much um, fun I had um, going out and, and just, just buying the things to, to, put, to, to put into one of those. Um, I, think, I think it was a great big gift bag and uh, particularly buying, buying really good chocolate. You know, thinking <laughs> so, 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 yeah, you, you want someone to feel loved. Uh, that's, that's a really effective way is to give them really, really nice chocolate. Um, it sure yeah. is. <laughs> it sure is. I remember the very, when we were, Glendine Gerard from Defend Dignity and, and I were planning the launch of this, of these bags and the communication about them. And we weren't quite ready. And one day she called me and just before we got started and um she said can you go and fill two bags today do you have time and i was i was having a terrible day in fact i i grabbed the kleenex and 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 stuffed up my tears just to answer the phone that was the kind of day i was having and uh I, my first instinct was i can't do that today and um and then i decided that i that I would do it. She she said it's just that it's it's a mother. There's a woman that's just been rescued from trafficking, and she has a little boy, and she's also pregnant. And boy, if that doesn't uh, put your life into perspective, I thought, how can I not go and do this? And so, because we weren't even ready, we didn't have anybody else to do it. I went and did it, and what healing there was in walking down the aisles with that shopping cart to fill those bags for a woman in such need. 
I, I tell you, my, my problems from earlier that day seemed to melt away as I did that. It's just not, you're doing something good, but you, you gain back so much more. That's one of the things that I, I, I find, I'm finding myself reflecting on over and over again. And when I talk with colleagues, that, um, that, that, that deeper understanding of how the spirit works, that God, God's spirit working through us, if we're able to be something of a conduit, um, mm-hmm. that as it flows through us, you mentioned how, how that can be so healing. Um, not that our problems go away, but we are, we are somehow strengthened to um, to live in the midst of our own stuff um and and you know logically you might think going out to help somebody else when my own life is kind of in a shambles would be would be um the opposite of what i need to do i should focus on myself but so often i hear this from people that the most healing strengthening thing they can do is to let their heart stay open and let god's love flow through it and then do what they are called to do to help somebody else and somehow you're reconnected to what life is for what 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 Mm -hmm. where where the meaning of life is and then that that self-giving love um yeah over and over again jennifer i'm hearing that from people saying yeah that's how that's how we get through times of personal crisis and times of the larger things happening in the world um to not, to actually to not be focused just on ourselves. Um, That's right. You know, it, as long as we're, we're doing it from a healthy place, as long as we are taking care of ourselves and aren't just throwing ourselves into things to keep busy, um, to not think about our own problems, um, really, we were created to serve. And I've, I've read some stuff that, that talks about how you know, as human beings, when we're when we feel like we're lacking something, we're down, we're we're needy, whatever, we we tend to run around trying to fill our lives with all kinds of things. What can we? Where can we travel? What can we buy? What can we do to fill our lives? Not realizing that the thing that's really missing is our service to others, and that is the thing that really fulfills us. That's kind of the missing piece. And studies show that people who give even just a small portion of their time whether it's once a week or once a month people who do that are much more fulfilled and happy in life and you know it's it's right from you know it's right from the bible you know we were we were created to serve others and you know we're to whom much is given much is required you know um we've been we've experienced god's amazing grace and how else can what else can that do but compel you to extend that grace and that mercy to others mm-hmm. that is the thing that makes the difference and we don't wait until all of our problems are gone away before we serve we we do it right there in the midst of it and find the healing that comes that goes a long way jennifer to explain um why so often you just seem to exude so much joy i i, I can remember when i first met you and uh, you were talking about really, really hard things. You were talking about the uh, the line of motels along the the QEW in uh, through Burlington and Oakville, which every morning are are filled up with sex trade workers and their johns. Um, and it was just a ho- horrible, horrible picture of the world you were opening my eyes to. But even so, you yourself were exuding so much joy. I thought. Even though I don't want to hear this, <laughs> I, I want to listen to her because because I like her. I, 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 there was something about you that was attractive, even though our topic was just so just awful. Um, and that I've often reflected on how God is at work with love and with joy, even in the crappiest situations. Um, sure. And how amazing that is! Um, yeah, that's part of why I wanted people to meet you because you because <laughs> um, you you've been that for me. You've been this um, this this sort of glowing candle of joy. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Um, I figure you know we're all we're all facing stuff. I mean, 
we have to make the most of it and just try to give our lives away. You know, um, I think it's Anne Voskamp that says, instead of trying to fill our bucket throughout life, when that kind of ties in with what I was saying, what if we just decided that our lives were something we could just go about emptying for others, you know? And in turn, then we're filled up. And so as we, as we engage in the, in the things that matter to God, I believe he fills our life with what we need, mm -hmm. you know, and he, it's good news. His, his, the gospel is good news. <laughs> Sometimes I think we forget that. It's really good news and we want to share it in practical ways. Yeah. We want them to, other people to have hope <laughs> and Absolutely. joy. Right? I, I was just going to ask you, who are some of your inspirations? You know, uh, things that you've um, heard or read um, that, uh, that, that, are, that have been and continue to be an inspiration for you. Well, I think, you know, we're, we are made up of all of the things that have always impressed us. There's so many people and things lines from a poem lines from a song things that were deeply embedded in me as a child that you know sometimes you don't even realize till later oh i tucked that away and i didn't even know but um when it comes especially when it comes to this area i think one of the books that was really influential for me was um half the sky by nicholas Kristoff and cheryl would do and they were both um they both worked for the New York Times. They're a married couple, and they wrote a book about um, how the empowering young women throughout the globe um, is the answer to a lot of the world's the crises in the world. And of course, they had a section on human trafficking. So that was one of the first things that I read about that issue. And then I read a book by Christine Kane. Um, she's that powerful gospel preacher from from Australia. You know, she's, she's just incredible. I think she, she's part Greek, um, but she started A21, which is an anti-human trafficking organization, and she wrote a book called Undaunted, and I read that, and I remember reading um, one of the chapters out loud to Shannon, and I couldn't, I was sobbing, I couldn't even get through the words. She was talking about, um, in Greece, meeting with uh, a bunch of women that had been trafficked and they were sharing with her their horrific horrific stories and it was kind of at the point where she was just beginning to really learn about it herself and one of the women in particular um when she was you know christine was sharing her sympathy her empathy with the situation the woman looked at her and said why didn't you come sooner and it just really that really gripped me. And that was in the stages when I was really beginning to feel this urge to do something. But you know, it's not really the big authors, the big famous people that have been the most influential. I think it's been mostly the ordinary people and maybe they wouldn't want me to call them ordinary, but just, um, just regular people that are trying to do something in the midst of their circumstances and one of my big influences has been Glendine Gerard, who was a pastor's wife in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church and leading the women there. And um, she, in 2011, she started Defend Dignity, and that's an international organization. And I mean, they're very influential in Ottawa, and they're always traveling all over the place. She's here, there, and everywhere. But when I told her, she's an Oakville resident, and when I told her that I wanted to learn more, could I chat with her? Within a few days, I had a lunch meeting with her. And it meant so much that she would take the time. And I found that to be um, very inspirational, that somebody that was kind of like I was, here I was a pastor's wife, she'd been a pastor's wife, um, that she had been able to step out and do something like this. And it's, it's not just her, it's a whole bunch of just regular people because I, I, I love that quote that uh, Margaret Mead said that never doubt that a, a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. You know, it's the only thing that ever has. And it's, it's the ordinary people that make the difference overall in most issues globally. Um, people just deciding that they want to be somebody who does something. Just take a step.
Thank you. Um, what are you doing these days to keep your spirits up? Well, one of the things I, I'm doing is not putting pressure on myself to learn a new skill, a new language. <laughs> There's been so much of that. It, 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 the problem with social media can be that you, you measure your life by what everybody else is, is doing. And so some people are just baking all these incredible things. Well, that's not me. Some people are learning a language or learning how to play an instrument or... No, I'm just letting myself off the hook. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep a little bit of a schedule. Trying to exercise so that you know I will be able to wear those button pants <laughs> when we go back, and um, and do some reading, but not no pressure. I'm trying not to put any pressure on myself. I'm just trying to take one day at a time and just be. <laughs> um, I do connect with a lot of people i like to check in on everybody i know <laughs> how you doing um and i started a little uh facebook page for my neighbors that didn't really get a lot of traction but i put posters up on the mailbox and i said join this facebook group and try to try to connect them and post some positive pictures and little things on there just for anybody that felt lonely or down. When it started, I didn't know where we were going. I didn't know if we were going to end up in a barter system where we're trading butter for eggs, <laughs> you know? So it, so I just thought it would be good to connect. So I, I, I like, for me, it's connection. I keep trying to reach out and connect with people um, and not try to take on too many new things. That's very wise. <laughs> Well, this, this is going incredibly well, you know, and I, I think I, I, I told you that part of why I was doing this, um, well, well, two parts to it. One, I wanted to share with my, my congregation in Harrow a um, little, little bit of the spirited people that I know. I thought the, the, the season of Pentecost was a good time to, um, to talk to some people who I see the spirit at work in rather than, you know, preach a lofty sermon about how the spirits at work, here's some stories. Um, and the other reason is, is um, this whole thing about preaching into the camera of my laptop. Uh, um, I, want to, I want to keep this vital and alive and interesting for people. So ha having other voices um, really helps. And uh, I think people are going to, people are going to, are going to like hearing from you. Um, I, I, I so one of the things that I, I always do in these little interviews is at the end I ask, um, what are the things that the folks of Harrow Congregation can pray for, for you? Well, I guess my biggest prayer would be that I can keep doing what I'm doing for many years and keep learning. I think that's the biggest thing. I feel... I'm enjoying being a person who keeps learning and evolving. Um, about, like I said before, I've a lot of my life I had my head in the sand about a lot of issues. I feel like I was quite naive. Um, and now I'm leaning in, I'm listening, I'm learning. The world is a whole lot less black and white <laughs> than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm enjoying this process. And I love connecting with people. And I love um, bringing awareness to human trafficking. And so in 2018, in April, so it's been over two years now, I was diagnosed with incurable cancer, stage four breast metastases, no cure, just medicine that will buy me some time. And we have no idea how long that would be. It could be quite a few years. But my deep prayer request would be, you know, I would love to just be able to keep on going for a long time and not have this uh, knock the knees out from under me. i got to tell you, I pray for that all the time. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. The prayer is... Um, it means a lot. Sometimes people think that that's just a pat thing when you just say, oh, I'll be praying for you. But it does. It means a lot. It really does. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you feel 
you know, you have down days where you feel like you're too weak to pray for yourself. And, and I think that as caregivers, we don't spend a lot of time praying for our own needs. We, we're always thinking about other people and their needs. So it's kind of like I'm, I have to give that job <laughs> about me to everybody else. Well, you have, you have my prayers, and I know you have Lexi's prayers. Um, we are so grateful to know you and Shannon, um, and we want to keep knowing you in this life for, for as long as we can. Um, can. Can the folks of Harrow also pray for Evangel Pentecostal Church in Oakville? That would be amazing. We always try to pray for other churches. We're very, at Evangel, we're very um, aware of the other denominations, the other people plugging away, trying to share the good news, and um, we pray for other churches, so we would love for you to pray for us. Yeah, that would be great. Is there anything, anything in particular that we could pray for? Well, I think, uh, to be honest, very practically, finances would be, would be an issue. Um, we're holding our own, but for, for people to continue to faithfully give, um, we want to continue to be able to support our missionaries the way that we have. We, um, we, we never t take money away from them, no matter what comes in, but that hits the rest of the budget. Mm -hmm. Um, and pray for a real, a real understanding of what the church is i've been enjoying this time of not having services because i find so many evangelical christians put too much emphasis on the sunday gathering and as wonderful as that can be if that's all that christianity is is just a sunday gathering um well we're not very effective um you know monday to saturday and our people are good people but i would love to for them to really really truly grow in their personal faith apart from the sunday gathering for for the roots to go really deep during this time Our pastoral prayers for June 28th. Dear loving God, we give thanks for all the ways your spirit makes itself known to us in our lives. The love we experience for others and from others reminds us every day that you are real and you are always with us. We pray for the consolation and strength of those we know who are grieving. We think especially of the families of Lucille Craig, Nell DeVollins, and Bill Gorick. We pray also for all those who have suffered recent losses have had to learn new ways to say goodbye and to celebrate the lives of their loved ones. We pray with gratitude for the dedicated people who work in the funeral service industry. We pray with appreciation for the June 27th miracle, a wonderful expression of human solidarity and generosity at a time of great need. Food is such a basic issue in our lives, an equalizing thing, as we all need to eat. We are all able to be, to be better humans with each other when relieved of the worry about where our next meal will come from. We pray for those who make their living on the land, in the agriculture industry. They work hard, assume tremendous risks, and are not always recognized or honored for their efforts. We pray for farms who employ migrant workers. We pray that common sense, compassion, and basic decency will govern the relationships between employers and their workers. We give thanks for the farmers who treat their offshore workers as treasured assets or even like family. We pray with concern for those workers who are not treated so well. Help us all remember, as tensions rise and concerns grow about the economic impact of COVID-19 and the measures in place to control the spread of the virus, that wherever we come from and however, however we work to support our families, we're all humans and we're all brothers and sisters in God's family. We pray for our political leaders and appointed officials placed in positions of great responsibility and authority. Help them to exercise that power with wisdom 
and without losing sight of the lesson learned from centuries of human history, that it's never helpful to scapegoat or to blame the least powerful in a situation for problems they did not cause and over which they had no control. We pray for business owners and employees anxious about their livelihoods. We pray that overwhelming economic concerns do not lead to harsh attitudes and inappropriate targeting and throwing of blame. As we approach the 153rd anniversary of the founding of this nation, Canada, may we do so with respect and awareness of the nations that knew and cared for this land before our ancestors arrived. This land is not just our land, and it has history about which many of us do not know enough. Help us to open our hearts and our minds. Loving God, we are living in such strange times. There are so many new causes for anxiety and confusion and tension. There are also long-standing issues that can no longer be avoided. We have little choice but to discuss them, to confront them, to struggle to understand, and to work with others towards healing. There is a legacy of racism, of exploitation, and of white privilege deeply woven into the fabric of our culture and the systems and structures of our society. We need help and courage, faith and love, and determination to create a more equitable, fair, and just future. Help us to do better for the sake of the generations that will follow. We pray for the congregation and leaders of Harrow United Church and all other faith communities and people of goodwill who do your work in the world. Help us to be instruments of peace, distributors of kindness, and good examples to others of the joy and meaning to be found in following the Jesus way. We pray also for the Reverend Jennifer Potter, Assistant Pastor at Evangel Pentecostal Church in Oakville and founder of 41 Oakville, an important ministry that confronts the evil of human trafficking and offers hope, love, and tangible support to those who have been hurt by it. We pray for Jennifer's congregation, her ministries, her family, and for her well-being as she continues to thrive while also living with stage 4 cancer, for which there is no known cure. Bless her and help her, God. We pray now using the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.